also welcome for me. Um, I'm from Gdata, um, employee um, making mobile malware analysis, and uh, I'm Hanoi One. Um, we are presenting this evening event after this talk, and uh, you're all welcome to um, eat some food, drink something, and discuss with the speaker, with uh, um, employees of Gdata, talking about uh, bachelor thesis or master thesis or whatever or jobs. We are also offering jobs and so <laughs> web analysis uh, Money. guys and <laughs> that and that. Yeah. So uh, feel welcome to come after that. So we are starting at uh, 6 p.m. and um, the address is also there. And now uh, have fun with this uh, nice talk. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so yeah, w welcome uh, from me too. Thanks for attending this kind of session in this very beautiful uh, weather outside today. So it's a little bit of hard to crunch your head on some stuff instead of being outside with this beautiful weather, but I think we can make it and we'll definitely have some reward uh, later on in the uh, sponsored lunch, or sponsored dinner this evening. This should be great. Okay, so uh, just uh, the title is Security DevOps. This is what we are talking about. Uh, it's uh, basically ways of freeing Pentesters time to focus on the real high-hanging fruits. So uh, first a brief introduction of myself. Uh, I'm a freelance software developer, white hat hacker and trainer, uh, freelancing since the end of the 90s and focusing on Java EE and web security stuff. Uh, regular speaker at several conferences and uh, also go by the Twitter handle just in case. Um, so I think you've got some pre-knowledge about the status quo about security, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Um, just a brief recap. What do we have in security is mostly, mostly two or three distinct types of, of checks we can perform. Uh, one major part of that is the static application security testing part, SSIT. Uh, this is a SAST. This is the way of static analysis to do um, code analysis, code reviews using tools, focusing on our source code or on, on uh, bytecode whatsoever to uh, get some kind of anti-patterns in terms of security, some potential vulnerabilities out of that. The other part is DAST, Dynamic Application Security Testing, which is uh, more in terms of the general pen testing uh, stuff, the fun part that you eventually know. So where you uh, assess the uh, dynamic posture of a web application by using not only the browser, mm -hmm. but using tools that interfere with the browser to assess what the, the application looks from the outside in its dynamic view and fire some kind of uh, payloads against it and see what the result brings if eventually some of these trigger some vulnerabilities to show up. And also we do have some, some problems in terms of the, the uh, frequency. So we do have more, more rollouts in, uh, in agile projects than we can cover using uh, our technologies and our skill and our bottlenecks of time as the security testers to assess these kinds of rollouts uh, at the proper depth in terms of security. So the more agile a project is, the more frequent the project uh, goes to production, the more uh, less time we, we have as security professionals to do the analysis of these kinds of uh, projects. So there is some kind of risk looming from behind uh, in terms of um, not testing it to, to, to the extent we should penetrate and test the application prior to launch or at least missing a pen test completely just due to the frequent rollout pace we observe in uh, agile projects that, so that we only focus on, on major releases for example. So just take a, a, a agile project that goes into production several times a week. It's not that uncommon and uh, there's definitely no way to have a security test for all of these five releases a week. So there must be something that we can do and this is what this talk focuses on to free Pentesters time to focus on the high hanging fruits so that the, the medium and the low hanging fruits eventually should be catched by some kind of um, tooling and automation we can embed into the security uh, development life cycle, software development life cycle. So um, in usual software projects we do have a um, broad amount of automation which is some kind of build server like Jenkins which when I commit into the git repository my source code as a developer automatically picks up and takes the, the, the Maven build to execute in terms of a Java application for example and uh, eventually perform some automated unit testing not focusing security yet 
uh, just functional and technical testing and eventually does also some kind of integration testing or UI testing where some, some automation from the outside is being used. And these are basically the tools that developers are, use, are using uh, to get the, the pace into the rollout frequency in order to become more agile. And so we as security professionals should not be uh, cut off there. So uh, we must find a way to cope with that and use eventually these kinds of tooling and automation in our own security, uh, security CI chain, uh, continuous integration chain to more or less automate certain aspects of security tests during the build life cycle. So uh, closing the feedback loop to the developers uh, quite early and so that we as pen testers then later on have more time to use for the high hanging fruits that only can be found using manual pen tests. So it's basically about uh, finding a solution that scales across the company about a multi-project uh, development teams and uh, to free Pentas's time to hunt for more high-hanging bugs. And for this we need to embed certain tools and certain frameworks into the build chain that the developers are already using so that we augment that with more security checks and for this um, I will present a security DevOps maturity model which can be seen as some uh, automation tips within the OpenSAM uh, uh, from the OWASP, the OpenSAM um, a maturity model about security practices and we're focusing on the verification phase for security testing and code reviews. Um, so basically we're taking the, the DevOps movement and introduce security into that area as well. So what levels will we cover? We um, will cover four levels for each of the different axes of the security DevOps maturity model I'd like to introduce and I chose to use the belts of the uh, of martial arts domain for that just uh, to focus on the the middle four so the white one is implicit and the the mastery belts is not covered by this uh, this session and these kinds of automation because this is where human beings must perform manual pen tests and manual analysis. So um, I will present four axes of this maturity model for security DevOps. This is the dynamic depth, the static depth, the intensity and the axis of consolidation. And there are four different belts, four different levels that we can reach in terms of automating things and we can then draw nice graphs for that but this is just for management. Um, so we will like to, <laughs> likely to, um, to focus on the open source tools now uh, that can be used to implement this kind of approach. Okay. So the first axis, the, the most uh, important one or the most uh, lengthiest one in this talk is the axis of dynamic depth which is basically about where dynamic security tests are applied inside a build system, a build automation system. So the yellow belt for that, uh, just the first level that we can achieve in terms of introducing security in our DevOps uh, environment is to scan just for, the, for web applications for the public attack surface, scan just that pre-authentication, so not logged in with the application, just throw a tool at it and see uh, what it does during the build. So this would be a nice spidering of the UI layer, for example, and there's no requirement to authenticate the scanner with a target then, and an easy integration of the scanner in the nightly builds possible uh, as a post step after the build has been performed, just like a regular integration or UI test. So for some tools, uh, we are, uh, this talk we're focusing on open source tools. Uh, there are good commercial ones available as well, uh, especially in the terms of uh, intercepting proxies. Uh, but focusing on open source ones, um, we, we do have the OWASP ZAP, very great uh, tool for that. Um, eventually you know that some of the features uh, the ZAP has, like active and passive scanning, uh, spidering of a web interface, uh, good manual payload delivery and some fuzzing stuff. But nice screenshot of the UI for Zap, so it's a user interface that you can use on a desktop. But basically these features don't really mainly focus on what we need in terms of security DevOps. We need some other features for that because automation is the key there. And for that we have features like um, a headless operation mode we can use. We can run Zap as a daemon. And it has a very great REST API that we can use to remotely control that kind of daemon once it's running during the build. It's highly scriptable and also has some kind of command line interface. 
So uh, how can we use OWASP ZEP and combine this in with something else eventually to put into the uh, Jenkins build automation server in case you're using that in your projects or the projects you consult with. So um, Jenkins is a build server which automatically picks up uh, from the source code repository a new uh, commit and then executes the build chain down eventually towards a deployment in case you're using uh, that towards the continuous delivery and deployment thing. Um, uh, it's broadly used and there are several plugins that you can plug into this kind of build server like Jenkins and one of these plugins not coming from the OWASP is the uh, ZAP proxy. So basically the name is just alike and it relates exactly to the Open Web Application Security Project's ZAP proxy tool. So using these two tools, the ZAP proxy and the ZAP proxy plugin of Jenkins, uh, quite young, allows us to spider and scan as a build step in the Jenkins uh, build server automatically. So you just um, point a URL, uh, point the URL of the application into the, uh, uh, you'd like to test, into the uh, ZAP proxy plugin so that ZAP proxy knows during the build where in your build when it continues where the um, uh, integration system with that freshly built artifact is available so where you're currently testing the UI tests during the build and then all the uh, scans that can be performed and spiderings that can be performed by ZAP will be executed automatically. Uh, also it has the possibility to generate a HTML or XML report into the uh, target folder of that build from the findings it eventually generates so that we can use this uh, during the nightly build, for example, to uh, generate some kind of outcome. So uh, this is how it looks like. So first in Jenkins you can configure that kind of plugin to uh, start during the build the headless mode of the ZEP proxy, give it some time to start eventually and where uh, the, the, uh, the port number should be configured. Um, so that during the, the nightly build eventually um, the ZEP proxy will be automatically started from within Jenkins and then you just provide a pointer to the URL you'd like to test to scan or spider whatsoever and uh, give it also some kind of output format like XML or HTML that it should generate and that should be then placed into the build folder. Uh, all these kinds of tools that you can use to automatically scan and spider uh, web applications also save some kind of session that you can also take into the build so that it manually can be used, that kind of session file, uh, to open up with the ZAP desktop uh, version uh, from a security professional in case there's some finding you would like to closely inspect what ZAP generates. Um, also Arachne is a very good uh, open source security scanner that you can use for web application pen tests and it has some features relevant for security DevOps integration. Uh, one of course is passive and active scanning, um, but most of all it has a internally operating headless browser cluster that's, that's very helpful if you've got lots of JavaScript based application because it really renders all this kind of JavaScript and executes it basically like, uh, like a Phantom JS. eventually you know that. And uh, therefore it, it has a, a, a more deeper look in terms of spidering a JavaScript uh, intensive into application. Uh, in terms of automation, at least there's a very good CLI that you can use. Um, uh, it also can be deployed as a web server running with a web UI that you can then remotely control. But the command line interface, the CLI, is uh, very mature. That's very helpful. How can we combine Arachne with, say, for example, Jenkins as the build server to achieve some kind of security DevOps? Um, and this can be done using the CLI step in Jenkins because there's, at least not known to me, uh, no uh, Arachne plugin existing for Jenkins, not yet. Uh, but it's not really required because the command and interface of Arachne is quite well so that we can then use that kind of interface to just execute during the build after the functional tests are fine a security test by simply putting a command line interface step into the build description of Jenkins and let that execute pointing towards the application to the URL under test on the integration system automatically deployed during the build. Um, this is a lengthier integration uh, of, of security in terms of uh, how long the scan might take so this should be 
better done in the nightly build, not in the on commit build. Otherwise, this should be uh, uh, just stripped down to some basic tests. Uh, it generates a HTML report as well that you can use, uh, where you can drill down in the findings, uh, SQL injection whatsoever, cross site scripting, different flavors, including, including DOM based, and then get a report out of that. Also, we have uh, BDD security as a framework available, which is a behavior-driven design-based approach, BDD, for functional and technical security tests. So for the, for the technical security tests, checking against cross-site scripting, SQL injection, XML vulnerabilities, it uses internally the ZAP as a scanning engine. And for functional security tests, you can write your own, like privilege escalation tests, it's user A eventually seeing something from user B or whatsoever doing some tests. Um, before I show you an example story file of that, um, BDD security is uh, very nicely integrated in, in, in two uh, major points, which is first of all it has a very great Selenium integration so that you can use the existing technology, eventually the project you uh, would like to address security DevOps um, is using for UI tests, can be used like Selenium uh, to extend that into the security domain. And the other point where BDD security has a very good security integration is uh, the Jenkins or other build servers just because of uh, the behavior driven design approach which is fit into BDD security by using jbehave as a framework for given when then stories so that it has a very tight and good integration into the build system domain and into the UI testing domain coming from the Selenium integration and combining these two you can get a very nice approach of security tests so you can define for the technical security tests you can define uh, BED security stories uh, in the given when then mantra like uh, given a fresh scanner with all policies disabled which is then zap eventually in internally and the attack strength is set to high and the cross-site scripting policy is enabled if you would like to test for cross-site scripting, for example. When the scanner is run and false positives described in some kind of table are removed, it's important, uh, so that you not, not ever again and again get the same findings where you say that's a false positive, then no medium or higher risk vulnerabilities should be present. So these are quite self-expressing uh, story files that you can write and BDD security translates that onto uh, using the, the ZAP scanner and uh, configuring that according to your policies, ruling out the false positives defined somewhere else and uh, triggering a build to break if the assertion no medium or higher risk vulnerabilities should be present is not fulfilled, for example, then you get a report from that. That's quite nice. Also on the table we have for uh, just th throwing a tool and let it scan at the uh, build, uh, we have a gauntlet which is also very nice uh, behavior-driven based framework close to BDD security in terms of given when then stories. Uh, it more integrates more scanners, more tools like Arachne, Zap, SQL Map, eventually you know that from SQL injection exploitations and tests. And if you're using, that's the, the biggest uh, win of this, if you're using uh, multiple scanners and tools in your arsenal, uh, then you eventually could use Gauntlet uh, in order to execute them automatically in your build using again given when then story files that then can be used uh, to produce some kind of output that the build server uh, like Jenkins could consume. More tools available but not covering all of them. So this was the, the yellow belt, the, the first one we could achieve in the axis of dynamic depth. Now we go to the um, level two, the orange belt in the dynamic depth level, which is uh, just uh, extending the automated scanning of the UI um, in the dynamic application security testing, extending that into the post auth parts of the application, so post the authentication step. For this to be properly working, we have to take care of something. We, and the tool that therefore we use, needs to properly maintain session state. Otherwise, it would not really get into the authenticated parts of the application. Uh, it leads to detect when a logout has occurred due to whatever reason. If the, the tool, the scan doing spidering and attacking gets locked out, it needs to first detect that and obviously re-log in and continue again. 
And for this also uh, it makes sense that the tool we use handles some hardening measures against certain uh, vulnerabilities automatically so that these hardening measures don't break the scanning and the security testing. And we can, can use ZAP for that as well, to guide ZAP into the post-authenticated areas in continuous integration world uh, with um, a few steps. So there are multiple alternatives available. One of them is to use uh, the, the desktop version of ZAP manually, just initially as a, as a development team, one time, and configure a context in the UI of ZAP, uh, in the desktop version, which defines information about how authentication is performed. Is it form-based? Is it whatsoever certificate-based, uh, uh, HTTP authentication-based, whatsoever? Uh, you define regular expressions for the logged-in and logged-out indicators, and you define eventually also the users, otherwise it wouldn't make any sense, uh, which is basically the credentials and the users you'd like to use. And then just save that information from ZEP into ZEP's format of a session file and check this in into the source code repository. So development teams can, can use this, can, can configure that in the UI of ZEP and desktop version, save that as a session file, check it in for use afterwards during the automation phase in the build by the Jenkins plugin. Um, also, uh, it's something we need, need to set uh, after this as well. Some, some data like the active session and some more information needs to be uh, provided currently to ZEP for this to function. And for this we can use the REST API, very good, uh, of ZEP which is running during the build. So we need a little bit of glue code for this as well. This is what the, the ZEP looks like, the UI, where you define the context in the authentication area. Uh, you can define uh, the, the target URL where you'd like the login to uh, submit against, uh, the kinds of post body parameters where the username and password fields are mapped, and it, it also includes either logged in or logged out indicators, which are usually uh, some kind of um, regular expression matches to use uh, to detect that currently we are still logged in. So like my account or uh, the, the presence of a, of a logout link or button is an obvious indicator that we are currently logged in. Uh, so I uh, just need one of these two uh, so that the tool can determine whether during the scan it has been thrown out and has been logged out or not. You can then save this kind of configuration. You just need to adjust it in terms of uh, several times when, when the project needs to uh, change something in the way authentication is performed, then you need to adjust this information as well. Otherwise, if you're not as a developer touching, uh, touching the login, then this file can be left as is. So most of the times it's a, it's a one shot you need to do uh, only one time. And then save this in the code repository and in the setup of the ZEP proxy Jenkins plugin, then you can then simply point the um, the ZEP proxy Jenkins plugin to use the session file uh, from your code repository, the count one, as the seed for the current scan. So therefore, you successfully uh, augment the, the, automating, the automated scanning tool ZEP with uh, login and uh, authentication information and stuff like that by saving that in a session file and picking that up from the automated scan during the build. With Arachni, if we're using this in a uh, uh, way to, to automatically scan the post-authenticated parts of a web application, we can also quite easily define this using uh, the auto-login plugin. It uses, so uh, this is a way to define the URL, form field names, uh, credentials, locked in indicators, etc. with the Arachni and if it's a complex login, we can also use a Ruby script for that, uh, but most of the times the commander interface should fit for that kind of scanner. And we can then simply use that plugin in the Arachne command line call during the build and point it to the login action, that's the page containing the login form, and it then grabs and uses the, in the DOM because it has a JavaScript uh, engine interpreting that. It's fetching the form fields, it needs to fill with some values and a regular expression check for the logout and obviously we want to, to exclude the logout action and then let the application scan during the build. So therefore it spiders then in the authenticated parts 
and also as a way to <coughs> re-log in itself during the scan and the attacks uh, if it detects that it has been logged out. Uh, it's easier to, to do this uh, kind of post off scan with Orochni due to the very good uh, auto login plugin. Also, you can use Orochni remotely because it has a web interface if you deploy it as a web server. And there you can simply schedule scans from the outside. So there's no continuous integration requirement. Then we need to meet. So uh, it's just a way of uh, using Arachne to repeatedly on a recurring schedule scan on the integration system, say, for example, each night after the build has been performed uh, into the authenticated parts. For BDD security, the framework we use to have a, a way to have a behavior-driven design approach in security uh, in the DevOps domain, we can then use uh, Selenium because it's very tightly and very good integrated into the Selenium um, to, to provide a Selenium class that performs the login action, which could be recorded using the existing way Selenium scripts can be recorded and generated for the existing UI tests eventually. And we can use uh, that and let BDD security pick that up uh, in the uh, BDD stories so that BDD security then knows how to log in and how to scan from the inside of the application. For this, we need to extend a, in our, uh, like for example, a shop application, we need to extend some uh, class from a BDD securities framework and implement a login interface uh, in order to drive BDD Securities ZAP scanning into the login, into the authenticated parts. We need to implement three methods for this. Uh, open login page, just to navigate with Selenium, obviously, towards the login page, wherever it is in the application under test. And uh, the uh, login method picks up the credentials it gets from the configuration of BDD Security, then basically again uses Selenium to perform the login action, like filling out form fields, clicking on the button to log in. And the login method is simply checking if a user is logged in. Uh, same story here with the uh, logged in indicator as with ZAP. So just fetch or watch out for some information that you can determine whether in the response you're still logged in or have been thrown out. So just to implement these, the Selenium uh, parts could obviously be generated. This should be simply I am on the open login page um, just to use the Selenium to go to some kind of uh, URL where the login is residing. I eventually verify that the login button is available or whatsoever we need. The login itself then uses the Selenium driver to find the elements in the document object model in the DOM on the page where the username and password fields should be obviously cleared and filled with the username and password uh, we have in the uh, files from the configuration and then just perform the click on the logout, login button. And for the ESLOG in check, we simply um, can do some scanning if the page contains the my account link for a shop or whatsoever to see if you're still logged out, logged in or has, have been logged out. So what about CSERF tokens? Uh, Cross-site request forgery tokens, these nice protection tokens, the random ones you observe in most phone posts, for example, state changing requests or background requests. Uh, ZAP and BDD security, because it uses ZAP, can handle them very well. So can Arachne, so shouldn't be a problem to have a uh, more secured application and still be able to scan this. If scanning takes too long, uh, soon these tools really take some kind of minutes to hours. I've seen scans taking up many hours, so this should be something that only can be done in the nightly, and if it's nightly built. And if it's still running too long in the uh, security DevOps automation, then there could be a nice trick used, which is to apply targeted delta scanning, which simply means that development teams maintain some kind of scope delta files in the code repository. So, for example, for new dialogues or new backend calls they implement, they can use it's basically the stuff they touch during the sprint. They can um, maintain these kinds of files either by recording the UI interfaces running through ZEP or providing some kind of uh, URLs or patterns for URLs manually in a configuration file and then let the scanner use this kind of target delta file uh, to provide some scope uh, uh, for scanning. Uh, like in Arachne you can use the scope include and scope exclude patterns in ZAP, you can use the includes and excludes configuration tabs in the config of the context 
which you can then save in the session file or provide it during the runtime of the test to Zap using its REST API. And BDD security can also maintain a tabular file of regular expressions as scope. So basically the story is if the automated scanning takes too long on every nightly build, then just reduce the scope to what the developer team says in, call in terms of these targeted delta scope files has been changed and transform this information then into the seed of uh, scope that the tool of choice you use expects. Mostly it's regular expressions of URLs. So that scans only focus on these. Uh, on, on the other hand, you can also use a nice trick to, to tune and uh, be quicker with the scan to tune it. So uh, you can train the spiders uh, about the structure of the application to spider. So in terms of redundancy, uh, sometimes uh, it makes sense, uh, say for example, for an online shop where you've got hundreds and hundreds, thousands of, pr of products inside and a scanner would definitely not come to a end, at least not in a reasonable amount of time, because it detects every new product page and sees it as a very new page it needs to scan just because some ID value is changed um, and in the URL and using uh, the, uh, for Rachni for example, the scope pattern and path pattern and the other uh, parameters you see here, you can define certain patterns of the application to be used and scanned only once. Otherwise, it wouldn't make any sense to scan every product page because it's the same code running, just presenting different products in the shop. Uh, so uh, this makes sense to fine-tune the scanning configuration that it at least understands where a page is just an instance of an already scanned page when some product ID has changed. So this speeds up the scan definitively. Okay, so level three, the green belt of security DevOps in the um, dynamic depth axis is uh, not just scanning from the outside, from the UI. It's also scanning from within the different application layers of a typical application's architecture. So more or less do Dart scans at the back end as well and uh, eventually detect and scan parameter positions within the XML or JSON uh, requests, XML for SOAP, JSON for uh, RESTful requests. Uh, basically it's a scanning from within of the different applications layers and um, there are also ways of doing this. For example with ZAP, because ZAP operates as a uh, proxy server, a HTTP proxy server, we can place it also between the different backend calls for server to server communication. For example the web application uses some, some, some RESTful or SOAP web service backend to fetch something from the from the background uh, and um, from persistent storages or whatsoever. And then you can use Zap to use it as a proxy between the web application server and the backend uh, server so that all outgoing uh, HTTP requests from some Tomcat server whatsoever, you can use Java arguments in the, in the startup just to give it a proxy, uh, are then routed through the uh, daemon running proxy server of Zap so that it observes the XML or the JSON traffic. And then you need to drive traffic so through that, either by using the existing UI tests or integration tests you have from the outside, because they indirectly generate uh, backend traffic, obviously, or executing service tests directly against the backend services, in case you have any tests for your web services or any tests for your REST services. So just, just let them run and by being a passive proxy ZAP, it observes these kinds of XML and JSON requests. And then you need to be active, obviously, which then to attack it, which then means to set ZAP into the new attack mode it just introduced in the last few releases, which is a way to have uh, each newly observed request automatically scanned actively, each parameter of it. The injection points within XML data structures, including also JSON data structures, where a, a payload should be delivered to. So it understands XML and JSON and using the attack mode when proxying between backend calls, it then automatically scans from within. Very nice. Same can be achieved, but not so easily with Arachne. Uh, you can place it as a proxy between, again, between the backend calls and you can use the um, uh, passive proxy plugin of Arachne to train it so that it observes the XML and JSON requests and since version 1.1 of Arachne you can then use 
this kind of, of outcome from the passive observation, observation to the uh, and seed that into the active scanning phase, so that it then would actively attack these service interfaces. Level four, the blue belt of dynamic depth, targeted scanning of individual forms. So it's not just spidering yet anymore. So, uh, for example, to have a business compliant input you have into certain wizards that would a spider not be able to, to apply. And um, so, like for a shop, for example, you can fill the shopping cart, provide checkout information, to, then you can scan the shipping address page or whatsoever. Um, or access backend web services in a special order to test some workflow whatsoever. So, most of the times, a spider would not be uh, using and executing the, the natural flow a, a user would, or the business user would uh, interact with the application. So that's good for the other levels, but for this level, the blue belt, we need to have a, a targeted scanning of individual forms and individual wizards in the uh, user interface. So for achieving that with the existing tools like Zap, many ways exist. The simplest one would be just to integrate the uh, existing Selenium driven tests you eventually have with Zap and proxy them through the Zap in attack mode. So while these tests on the UI are running, Zap would execute every request. Uh, it observes every new one uh, as an active scan and therefore you have some wa way of uh, alignment with the business usage of a wizard but not to a great extent. This could be better with a more individualized version um, to en just enhance again with Zep, enhance the existing Selenium test code for the UI, for the functional UI tests you have by calling Zep's REST API at the proper positions within the workflow. So also you can use policies to configure Zep's scans to only do that kind of scans you would like to do. And this <coughs> could be done quite easily, just like a regular unit test to, to scan some uh, step like billing address and shipping address or whatsoever in a typical, typical checkout process of a um, shopping portal. Then in the setup, for example, you could then just start a uh, new proxy se session in the running ZEP. In the background it runs uh, that you can then use the REST API to initiate a new session for that and create your Selenium driver. You would do in every kind of uh, Selenium test the same. And, but this time configure it that it proxies through the ZAP running in the background on the build server. <coughs> and when it comes to test the shipping address, for example, you can use uh, the recorded, they should have been recorded obviously, the Selenium steps. You could use the existing Selenium steps from your, your UI tests to fill the shopping cart, to proceed to the checkout, to provide reasonable shipping address data, so all be within the workflow the application expects so that you can get to the correct spots of that wizard and with business compliant data. And then you use the REST API of Zap, uh, which is running in the background, to set some, some attack policy like only scan for SQL injection or cross-site scripting or whatsoever, XML attacks. And then just call the Zap API to actively scan the last seen URL. It has seen all the URLs of your workflow and then the last scene from the history can be used in the REST API and say, Zep, please scan this. So therefore you have a existing UI test, you augment at certain aspects with uh, a call to the security tool of choice, could be Zep for example, um, or Burp or whatsoever, very good tool also, to let this then scan. Same is for other the same is true for other uh, steps of this workflow as well. If you want to have some, some working example of a uh, version close to that, you can then, the idea basically, you can uh, see a running example on a very nice GitHub Zap web driver plugin. So uh, another way exists also, um, without direct Selenium exposure, exposure Zap can be trained of the workflow steps. So you could um, record a Zest script, which is a scripting language that Zap uses, um, that automatically can be uh, used to, to automatically scan then this kind of uh, recorded script uh, actively. And this can be recorded by using Zap as a proxy server and using your browser to proxy through the Zap and then let as a developer or tester, functional tester, and let then Zap generate the 
uh, the script from what it observes during the passive proxying phase. So that way you can, as a functional tester or developer, you can uh, use and train the, the ZAP by uh, recording, pre-recording the, the workflow you want to test with the security scans automatically later on and then use this for automation within ZAP. For BDD security, due to the fact that it, this framework integrates so nicely with the Selenium uh, UI testing automation, world. Um, you can do this also quite easily. Um, all you have to do is implement a Java interface that navigates within the application workflow like in our online shop to the shipping address uh, spot and fills data inside this. So um, this can then be called in the uh, given when then story files of BDD security. Just take the example you've just seen where the login is handled here this just commented out and uh, then you create a new method in that like full shopping cart and checkout for example that uses custom selenium code uh, could be recorded uh, and this custom selenium code then drives the use cases in in the particular order in the particular usage pattern the application expects like filling a shopping cart going to the checkout and providing the uh, reasonable data to this step you would like to scan and in the given when then story files of BDD security, you could then reference this kind of method that uses Selenium code just to go to the spot you'd like to scan, fill a shopping cart and check out. You can then reference this method in the given when then story files, like given a new scanning session and the page flow described in the method, this, the pointer to the method, is run through the proxy and 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 etc. That, so there's an easy connection to, to have BDD security working with its active technical scannings in, uh, by using ZAP under the hood, working on the steps of a workflow you previously uh, navigated to with Selenium. If no Selenium test code exists, well, okay, so then eventually give developer teams access to ZAP so that at least they can pre-seed the scanner directly. So without any Selenium, they can at least uh, use for the new user interface or new dialogues they, they are developing or backend calls they are developing. They can use Zap as a proxy for that, use the browser of their choice to navigate once over all these nodes of the application's workflow they are developing once it's finished or close to finished and then save that session file of Zap into the code repository so that the automated scan picks it up and can use it as a pre-seed so that it sees all the nodes and all the workflow steps to scan actively during each nightly build and there's no need for Selenium tests uh, the, of these tests uh, to execute these pages as well. It just makes sense if the spider didn't catch it up. Also, you can use to get the blue belt, you can use some, some direct unit tests for APIs, also a very interesting topic. So sometimes it's useful to have some direct tests at the programmatic API level, not just at the UI level. Uh, so this could come from a unit test, for example, um, that directly calls an API. And you could use payloads from, from FastDB or generate your own with fuzzers like Redemza, uh, which basically can be used to um, derive certain malicious or interesting patterns from the original ones and then check the response, what the, the method of the API call generates. As a simple check, but to have a more, more detailed check and more insight into the way the application's uh, API you would like to test handles this kind of maliciously input. Um, uh, you can then use also probes from within. So this could be to investigate log files or this could be to uh, use aspect-oriented programming to have some kind of uh, augment augmentation on the methods that are under the call graph of the method on the test so that then you can get some output from them as well. Or use OWASP, up sensor, whatsoever, different levels uh, uh, to, to watch out for. But log file analysis is also a very good one because you get stack traces from them and then you can correlate them uh, uh, like a database exep uh, exception you, you see, SQL exception you see that this might potentially be a good hit for a SQL injection due to some level of uh, SQL injection payload you provided from a FastDB value to the uh, API call. So you can also extend existing unit tests using these technologies to have more uh, security tests in your test automation as well. So this was the lengthiest part, the dynamic one. 
Uh, now we focus on the static depth axis how we can get uh, static security analysis into the security DevOps uh, continuous integration chain, CI chain. Uh, so it's basically about where are the static tests applied, the code analysis tests. And the, the yellow belt, the easy one, is uh, level one, just to, to assure that third-party code you use, the, the dependencies you use, uh, are not exposing any existing vulnerabilities, at least. So um, we have to check for the server-side dependencies, which is for Java applications, the JAR files residing in web and flip, uh, and also for client-side dependencies, which is for JavaScript uh, frameworks, for example, like uh, underscore.js, angular.js, or jQuery, or whatsoever you use, uh, bootstrap.js, and uh, check if these have eventually known vulnerabilities, server-side and Java-side dependencies. So this is useful even for projects that are not under current active development because um, even though they are uh, alive but not actively uh, developed, it could be the case that a new vulnerability in one of the frameworks they use could come to life and could become public so that you need to patch. So this is a great idea to have even these dead projects being built regularly on a nightly basis, even though the code doesn't change, just to execute these kinds of checks once and once and once again. Um, so the OWASP dependency check is one of these uh, tools that you can use. Uh, it basically scans all the dependencies, including the transitive ones, against the CVE, the Common Vulnerability and Exposure List, so the list of uh, vulnerabilities that have been observed in frameworks, components, products, whatsoever, libraries. It's available as a Maven plugin and as an ARN task, so it closely fits into your build system, and if it does not, you can use a command interface version as well. And you have a nice Jenkins plugin for the reporting as well, so that you can get some nice graphic reports from that. It's definitely not false positive free, so you need some kind of your time to triage the findings and suppress the uh, findings you would not uh, like to be reported again, false positives, but it's a good catch. So you see some kind, like the unit test report, you see some kind of vulnerability trends over the time axis in Jenkins build server uh, for the dependencies. It includes some, some details about the vulnerabilities that have been found, why it's a vulnerability and what uh, level of uh, risk you are therefore eventually exposing. Um, and for the client side, world. This is basically JavaScript libraries. There you can have uh, retire.js to put into your build chain as well. So it scans the application's JavaScript files that they use against a list of known vulnerable ones. And it's also there's a nice Maven plugin available and can also be used as a command line interface to nicely fit into your build system. Okay, so level two for the axis of static Depth, the orange belt, is to scan for important parts of this, the source code for security vulnerabilities. So, scanning your own code now. And this can be done, uh, or should be done at least, for important parts of the application. Better yet for all, obviously. Um, you can use, for the orange belt, also a kind of delta-based approach. So, you can scan at least the code that, that you touch, that changes um, during the, uh, the build. And in, in the open source world, we do have uh, not so many uh, code scanning tools, but we have Find Security Bugs, which is a plugin for Find Bugs. So, Find Bugs is an existing and established tool for finding anti patterns in uh, mostly Java, it's Java based, and uh, like uh, just uh, regular anti patterns, not necessarily security relevant. And um, the find security box is a plugin that fits into find box to extend this kind of static code analysis into the uh, uh, scanning for um, uh, security relevant uh, box, basically vulnerabilities in the code, vulnerability patterns. And um, it runs within find box so that it nicely executes in all Maven based builds and can also be used in, in Sonar and integrates also with Jenkins through the uh, a find bugs uh, way that is, is integrated into Jenkins, my own plugin, the static code analysis plugin of Jenkins, uh, can speak the find bugs style so that it can be used to have some, some trend analysis charts in, um, of vulnerabilities found in Jenkins. And also in Sonar, you also have a code pointer where you point your vulnerability uh, directly to the code in question that 
makes up that kind of finding. Um, for the JavaScript code, there are some DOM-based vulnerabilities, most importantly DOM-based cross-site scripting, that can be used uh, and found by a scanner, and uh, not all of them obviously. And uh, for this we have uh, Scan.js as the open source tool, which has optionally a web UI, but most of all it's executable from within Jenkins as a command line interface on every build. And it finds some kind of assignments into things where unsafe values make it into a sync for DOM XSS. But definitely it doesn't catch all the different ways, but uh, it's about finding low and medium hanging fruits in an automated fashion so that we can focus on the high hanging fruits in the manual pen tests. Uh, for Ruby and Rails apps, uh, there's Breakman, also available, a good command line interface based code scanner with a Jenkins plugin also that can be used to scan Rails code for security vulnerabilities. And other tools exist as well, including good commercial ones, obviously. So the axis of uh, static depth belt yellow, I uh, belt uh, green, level three. It's about scanning the complete application source code now. Not just in the previous belt, the, the important code. Now it's for every line of code in your projects. So this means also for find security bugs to pre-compile if you do have any JSPs to pre-compile them so that it also have a way to catch the uh, user interface layer and the templating layer you use. And the blue belt is just uh, for the static depth axis, it's just scanning of the, the code of third party dependencies. So it's not like checking and assuring that third party dependencies have no existing vulnerabilities. This is what Open Web Application Security Projects dependency check is about. This time it's about scanning the code of the dependencies you use for not yet known vulnerabilities. But you include that code into your application by using that library, so you should uh, be sure that there's no, at least no, highly ranked vulnerability in that as well. So this is easy for open source libraries you use. You can then simply use the code scanning techniques you have in your build uh, to uh, also scan, at least on a weekly basis, uh, you're not changing your dependencies that often, um, to, to use the, the source code artifacts of these versions of libraries you use and cover the, these with the uh, source code scans as well. For closed source components, while well, this could be done, uh, in, at least in Java, uh, by using find bugs because, uh, and therefore the find bugs, find security bugs plugin, because find bugs operates on bytecode. So it scans on bytecode, it does not necessarily have a requirement to have the source code available for finding anti-patterns like SQL injection things or whatsoever. And for this, it makes sense to let find bugs run on the dependencies where you do not have any source code available. So now for the axis of intensity. So uh, basically about, uh, it's about how intensive are the checks we are performing in a build automation, in a continuous integration chain. Um, and the uh, first, the easy level, which is the yellow belt, is just for the dynamic tests to so have just passive scans. That's easy. Um, proxies like Zap or Burp uh, use very, very good uh, uh, engines to have some passive analysis on the traffic they observe to get some easy low-level findings and catch them. And uh, at least some, some medium-ranked findings could be found as well, missing CSERF tokens, for example. That's a nice one. And um, for ZAS, for the static code checks, it's just letting the, the, the code be run through the scanner in an easy fashion. So this level means uh, basically not to increase the build duration, so that it can be run on every commit. Because having a passive analysis on the existing UI tests should not really extend the duration of these UI tests in an amount that it, it is no, not feasible to execute this on every commit. So the yellow belt here, uh, the passive analysis could be run on every commit. That should be quite easy. The orange belt, the next level, um, is now to include some light white active scanning. Eventually this might take longer, so this should be run on the nightly build, not on the on commit build and makes sense to reset the database after that because eventually some side effects could have been triggered. 
And this can be tuned to limit the types of attacks via policy files, for example. In ZAP you can configure quite well the policies, uh, the, the types of scans you would like to execute. If you're not having a database or not having a relational database uh, in your application, then you can eventually skip some tests and define a policy for that, for these kinds of light, wide active scans you would like to have. Check this policy file into the source code repository and let it be picked up by the uh, Jenkins ZAP proxy plugin so that it augments the ZAP scan with that kind of policy file. The level two, three, level three, the green belt of um, intensity access is to use heavyweight scanning during the build, at least on the important parts. So this could be to use, for example, riskier profiles to, to increase the threshold and strength levels of scans taking longer than obviously, or also use specialized uh, scanners like SQL Map for a SQL injection or specialized plugins or extensions of the existing scanners like ZAP's Advanced SQL inject sc Injection Scanner extension which is uh, uh, relating to the SQL Map scans. So uh, basically the idea is to scan more aggressively, actively in the um, nightly build, for example. And for the static code analysis tools, this means to increase the threshold and effort that the tool can spend on the scan. Level four, so the blue belt of the intensity axis is to use customized rule sets for the dynamic checks. So it could be, for example, for the dynamic part that the, um, the, the pen tests from, from uh, tools with Zap or Rachni that you would like to test for certain frameworks your corporation eventually uses in a project. If they are used in a way that they expose a vulnerability, then you can uh, code this kind of uh, scan with a very nicely uh, ZAP uh, configuration and, and coding and scripting capabilities. Or if you have a parameter payload that is somewhat hidden inside some base64 value of something, eventually signed something whatsoever, so that a scanner would not automatically pick this as an input vector to perform the, the scanning of uh, active attacks against. And then you can use um, uh, custom input vector scripts in ZAP that then are able to, to let the ZAP engine know how this kind of value should be constructed from the values it actively would like to scan against this value so that it conforms to the, say, base64 something of some values. So if you've got some certain weird looking uh, parameter values, you can train the, uh, uh, the ZAP proxy using custom input vector scripts that it would then use during its active scans. So that's basically some coding required here and that's definitely the, the blue belt. And for the static code scan, you can also write your own scanning rules in uh, find security box for Java scans, obviously written in Java. Or for Scan.js, you can write a JSON file to watch out for other patterns as well. So if you're using your custom own developed frameworks and you know if you're using the, this in-house framework in a certain aspect, then it might be a problem in terms of security. Then you can develop a rule for find security bugs to catch this during your build automation. Now that we've covered the three axes of dynamic depth, static depth and intensity, we now uh, take a look into the consolidation, the last axis. Because, well, it's about what are we doing with all the findings we get during the build. So the first three axes were about f generating findings, but what do we do with all these in an automated way? So uh, the easy one, level one, uh, the yellow belt, is to generate simply a human readable HTML report from that. Most tools do this, and we can link this in the Jenkins build server. Um, so there's an HTML publisher plugin available uh, in Jenkins that you can use that picks up any kind of HTML file that has been generated during the build and links it from the Jenkins UI. So you can configure the Jenkins HTML publisher plugin to use the, uh, the report file that Zap scan has generated and placed into your build from the other plugin that did the scanning. I title this as Zap report and then in the build of Jenkins you soon have a link for each build where Zap report can be clicked and you then get the report details uh, of what Zap eventually has found in your um, project during the scan. Also we could use some simple criteria for breaking the build, at least on heavy findings. So for the yellow belt it makes sense to um, 
either use the direct ways, the, the tools we use, the frameworks we use for scanning, either static or dynamic scanning, and let the build break on certain heavy findings. So there's some kind of automated feedback to developers. If they check in some cross-site scripting code, the build turns red, would be great. Um, uh, or check in some dependency library they use that is known to be vulnerable, etc., etc. So the, the tools we cover, dependency check for the dependencies, BDD security, uh, for the uh, behavior-driven design, story-based scans, find security bugs for the static code analysis, and Arachne for the uh, spidering. Uh, they all have either directly or indirectly a way to integrate with the Jenkins build system so that if there is something rated as a critical vulnerability, the, break would automatically, the build will automatically break, turning red and giving feedback to the developers. And for the other scanning tools, well, at least we could do a simple log parsing with the log parser plugin of Jenkins or whatsoever. It's the first level. Uh, so, for example, for, for OWASP dependency check, we have a way to define a threshold of how many vulnerabilities of how, uh, uh, of what kind of, um, of thresholds need to be present before build turns yellow or red. Find security bugs also nicely as a way to integrate with, uh, in terms of consolidation feedback to the developers, to integrate with a set of plugins of the, UD, of the IDE, like Eclipse. Uh, you, you do have some kind of plugins you can use to open the scanning results and then you see the findings, you can click on them, see them in the code, including some basic remediation information. And also there's a collaboration feature available that you can use with a, a find bug server running on your, on your, somewhere on your network that then can be used where a security professional can collaborate on that finding along with a developer. So for the orange belt level 2 of the consolidation axis, uh, we need to have some custom logic to make the build unstable or broken, not just the number of thresholds. Some custom logic like type of vulnerability, confidence level, how confident is the tool in the finding, uh, the severity obviously, etc., etc. And we need to use um, some or provide some useful information to the developers, how to fix that, not some generic information. And uh, we need to respect the suppression mechanisms uh, so that uh, developers or uh, security professionals can actively suppress findings if they see that's a false positive from the tool that is no longer being reported. And how can we do this? Flagging builds from reports uh, from within a CI job, um, in a continuous integration job like in Jenkins. So uh, most scanners emit XML files as well. Uh, not only HTML files, and we can use a simple XPath expression or XQuery checks against that kind of uh, XML file, just counting the number of uh, confident high severity findings. And if there's a certain level reached, then we can um, uh, set the build to be broken. Uh, so there needs to be some glue code developed, could be a Maven plugin, but not, not much. Um, alternatively, if the uh, XML, or the tool is not offering some XML or it's not really usable, then we can fetch the results by directly accessing the scanner's API, which means for ZAP, the REST API, and for Arachne, it's remote procedure call API, uh, also very good Ruby-based. Um, but be, secure to, or be sure to only break the build with findings of high severity and high confidence. Otherwise, this might severely backfire. Uh, so sometimes, in terms of automation, less is more. Um, or if there are many, many findings when introducing in an existing uh, application, introducing these kinds of automated checks, then the baseline approach is helpful, which means that you do not break on the existing findings, but you do break on new findings. Uh, for providing useful information to developers, there's a nice project available on uh, GitHub, the uh, VulnDB, quite, quite young, uh, which is currently counting 50, 65 vulnerabilities and more. Uh, so it basically can be used as a, uh, a starting point of your own custom remediation information. For example, if you know if the, there's a cross site scripting vulnerability, then the developers, because you're using this kind of templating in the UI, need to do exactly that. And then you can use code from the, uh, or the descriptions from these uh, repository of uh, generic uh, remediation descriptions for vulnerabilities, eventually clone that and extend it by your own custom uh, descriptions to guide your developers into the correct direction and uh, use this as the basis for the uh, customized reports like in HTML or whatsoever you generate. Uh, 
Basically, you're optimizing the quality of the feedback loop to the developers thereby. And you need to be taking care of uh, suppression faults, so any ways of suppressing false positives should be taken into account, otherwise uh, this would be degrading in uh, usability. And for that you need, for example, for BDD security to define a textual based file that can be checked in in the source code repository, the um, kind of uh, vulnerabilities you no longer want to re report on because they were flagged as false positives. For the static code analysis with fine security bugs, there's a suppress warnings annotation that you can use um, in Java on the false positive code lines. Um, or for dependency check, there's a uh, XML file that needs to be filled with suppression information, and so is something for retire.js as well. Um, for the consultation access to level three, the green belt, this is now for merging and real con really consolidating uh, and deduplicating results from different scanners, so including dynamic and uh, static application security testing scanners, and pushing the results towards the developers in a more uh, convenient way, not like HTML or PDF reports or broken builds, better yet to automatically generate tickets in the bug tracking systems the developer use, like Jira or whatsoever. Um, and for this, uh, ThreatFix, a local ThreatFix server can be used. It's very nice tool does all the heavy, listing of, uh, heavy lifting of importing native scanner outputs, uh, including the commercial ones, so like uh, uh, fetching the ZEP reports or fetching the BURP uh, scan files or the uh, Fortify check marks, Veracode, whatsoever. All these formats are accepted uh, and, and can be used from within ThreatFix, so it merges and deduplicates all the different kinds of findings from dynamic scanning and static scanning and can be used to push the findings toward the bug tracker and towards the IDE, like Eclipse or IntelliJ or whatsoever, for the developer. So it also provides plugins there. Very nice. The central uh, repository for vulnerabilities found in your security DevOps chain. And they can generate some nice reports, mm -hmm. including trending ones, whatsoever. And the last level, uh, level four of the axis of consolidation, in the security DevOps automation is to find the, the white spots, so to find which parts of the application's code have not yet been tested with the dynamic scans you execute in your build chain. And where you do need to do some more manual pen tests, obviously, and manual code reviews. And for finding these, at least for Java-based applications, um, you can use OWASP code pools, which is very nice. It instruments the Java application running on the Java application server and it collects coverage data from like code coverage from the uh, running application. So basically it, uh, if you start it and then let the dynamic security tests execute in your build chain and later on collect the results from code pulls in terms of a report, clickable one, then you can uh, you see what packages, what, what areas of your code have not yet been touched by the security scans you threw just against that. And um, so basically it shows you in a nice tree map fashion the, the spots that have not been covered by the tests where you need to perform some other kind of action like manual pen tests more or more manual code reviews or adjusting the scanners to more uh, the spidering to more uh, go into the areas where your methods lie. So that's basically about improving on this kind of uh, security DevOps automation. So that's it. Basically, thank you very much. We've covered four levels of um, security DevOps. Uh, most importantly, the dynamic axis, uh, and then the static axis, the intensity and the consolidation axis in each with four different belts. So it's a nice incremental steps that you can use to, in small steps, include, include in your build to enhance the uh, security posture of your build automation so that we as security professionals can get more pace in the security checks and to, to cope with the developers uh, executing more frequent rollouts in some certain way. It definitely does not remove the requirement for manual pen tests, not at all. So it's just about freeing the pen testers' time uh, to focus on the high hanging fruits, the other belts that have not yet been covered, where uh, no automation at all uh, can help. So this is about finding low level and medium level findings in an automated fashion during the build so that we close quite early the feedback loop to the developers 
and that we can focus in the uh, bottleneck time we as security professionals most of the times are on the high hanging fruits and do not over and over again have to report the same easy to catch findings that should have been caught before. So these are the links for the tools we covered, it's just open source tools, obviously you can exchange uh, most of them with commercial tools as well. There are very good commercial tools available, especially in the dynamic and static parts. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, I'm uh, glad to answer them, uh, either now directly or throughout the after session this evening. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for attending this kind of uh, talk, even though the weather is great outside. And I hope you get some kind of um, useful information from this presentation. Thank you.